Shalom Achim. Um, I greet you, my brothers, my rabbinical brethren uh, in Israel. And this video is directed to the rabbinical brethren as well as some of the political leaders of Israel as well. And I'm going to name uh, just a list of some uh, specifically. Um, and it, it, it includes other rabbinical brethren, both in Israel and around the world, specifically in Israel, though. Uh, Rabbis uh, Rav uh, Shlomo Amar, Rav Yonan, uh, Yona Metzger, Rav Eliyahu Bakshi Doran, Rav uh, Shalom Kohen, Rav Winston, Rav Tovia Singer, Rav Avigador uh, uh, Nevetzal, Rav Shemuel Rabinovich, Rav Tzvi Yehuda Cook, Rav Avraham Elakana uh, Shopera, Rav Zolomon Melamed, Melamed, excuse me, uh, Rav Mitzrachi, Rav Chaim Richman. These are a list, a few of the rabbis that I am addressing this to. Um, as far as political leaders in Israel, uh, I will also include you in this as well, some of the political leaders there. Uh, it is actually to all the political leaders of Israel, but specifically Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, President Shimon Perez, former president that is, also the new uh, president of Israel, um, uh, Cabinet Minister Naftali Bennett, and many, many others there that are in Israel. Uh, this is addressed to you. It is a very serious hour that we are, that we are in, our people are in. Um, I would like to first say my love and prayers are for our brethren, the three young men uh, that were taken by the Palestinians, kidnapped by the Palestinians, and we know that by the mercy of Hashem, they will be delivered and God will bring them home. And we are praying uh, with you. And I thank God for the solidarity that Israel has uh, come in for the return of our, of our brethren. And we certainly uh, not only praying that God will, will, will release them, reveal where they are, whether it's to the IDF or, or however God chooses to reveal it, but reveal where they are at. And we, we ask you, God, we ask you, Hashem, uh, to, to reveal this, dear God, so we will know. And that also that the heathen who has mocked the God of Israel will know that there is a God still that reigns in Israel uh, when he is... When he is uh, 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 defeated, uh, I should say. Uh, this message is a very difficult message to bring. It um, has nothing to do with, with, the, with the, what we were just speaking about, the three uh, brothers that we have that have been kidnapped. Nothing to do with that. I wanted to bring this out because uh, we are in solidarity with Israel, our people, and there are uh, as, as well as in the Christian community around the world, and I know not just the people we know, but many thousands of others that have been praying for God to, to speak and to answer and to deliver these young men back to their parents. And, and we want to remember also, those of you that are watching, I know that there are many, many uh, Christians that will be watching as well, and the thousands that is. And I ask you to pray especially for the mothers the mothers, the family members that are grieving for these boys not being home, how difficult it is beyond our own understanding what, especially the mothers, you know, mothers, children are so dear to the mothers and, and the fathers as well uh, that are grieving because of their children not being home. Uh, so we pray, we pray for them and our heart goes out to them as well. Um, the message tonight is very serious. It is uh, something that I feel that is important, and this is why I've addressed uh, the rabbinical brethren as well as the, um, uh, the political leaders of Israel. 
And um, for, for the rabbinical brethren that, that do not know who I am, if you were to watch this video, uh, my name is Stephen Vinun. Actually, Kateriel uh, Vinun is my legal name. It's not my Jewish name. It's my real name. Um, I am from the tribe of Levi as well as the tribe of Ephraim. Uh, according to family history and the documentation that we have. Uh, so if you wonder, as far as the authority to be able to speak on the Word of God, yes, I am a Levite through my father's side. Um, so I figure maybe this might be important for you to know this as I bring these things to you. I want to take you to the Tanakh, to the Navim, through the prophet Jeremiah, and I'm going to kind of read down near the bottom of the chapter and then go up and read other parts of the chapter as well. And I'd like to just share with you a very dear friend of mine, uh, Gary Lowry, actually had asked me over and over and over to read this chapter uh, along with also Malachi chapter 2. Uh, and I don't know if I'll take the time to go into chapter 2 as well, but he, he finally told me, he says, Brother Steve, he says, God has spoken to me and told me that you need to read this. And when he said this, he told me, he says, I don't know what the significance of this is. He said, but the Lord said, you will know. And, um, and you know, every obstacle has come up in reading this. And when I finally read it today, uh, he was right. The Lord placed in my heart. I know why he wanted me to read this. So, uh, not Brother Gary, but the Lord wanted me to read this. So I needed to share this with my brothers in Israel because we are in our homeland. Our people have returned home. Now, Zechariah says that the house of Judah would return first. And many of you rabbinical brethren, you have no idea of why. But just keep one thing in mind, if you would. We didn't go into captivity because we were good people. Not to say that there were not good Jewish people back in 70 AD when the Romans destroyed the temple and our people went into exile. We know, we have to admit, sin causes us to go into captivity. In fact, it had to have been worse than anything that our forefathers had ever done before 70 AD because we went into captivity. We, we, we are in the diaspora for more than, for nearly 2,000 years. So we really have to ask ourselves, what did our forefathers do that was so bitter that sent us into an exile for nearly 2,000 years? So I'd like you to keep that in mind as I discuss some things with you. Now, I say this because we are back in our homeland as prophesied. And as Prime Minister Netanyahu, as you said, never to be uprooted again. And I've had that on many of the front of, uh, intros on videos there, your words that you did at the United Nations. And I thank God for it. I believe that you were anointed when you said what you said. But there are some particulars that God is requiring us as a, of us as a people and as a nation before God is going to deliver our enemies into our hand. Not to say that he's not delivering our enemies on this front and that front, but you know, the thing is, when, when Joshua, whom I am a descendant of, when Joshua was on the battlefield and when he suffered loss of life, Joshua stopped the battle. And immediately he began to pray and to seek God to know why, why are we having, why are we having loss of life? You see, the understanding is, is that God has delivered our enemies into our hands. There should not be one casualty on any battlefield of an Israeli. You know, I saw a video one time, uh, it was a beautiful video, I think it was the 12 Tribe Films actually put this video out, and it was an American young man, Jewish young man, who had went and he served in the IDF, and he was talking about going into Gaza, extremely hot bed, and uh, before they went into battle, the, the, the rabbi brought them together in a circle and prayed over them that the God of Israel was with them, 
and they, they, I think they only got a scratch was all. One man got a scratch. They suffered no loss. He said, and, and, and though there was very intense fighting, he said they knew that God was with them. But many times, too, we still suffer loss. We shouldn't suffer one casualty in any war or any front that we have in Israel. But there is a reason why things are happening. And I say this, and, I, and let me say as well to President uh, Shimon Perez, you have an opportunity and a window of your own to repent, but you have brought Jezebel into our country. And I notice, Prime Minister Netanyahu, you have been reserved a little bit here recently, and I can understand why. You're under a tremendous amount of pressure. But you know, my brother, I am persuaded that you know that any kind of covenant with the Vatican is absolutely of Satan himself. And I'd like to take also the moment, I would like, above all of, of my rabbinical brethren, I'd like to, my heart and, is out and my hat, kippah is off to Naftali Bennett for the bold stance that he has taken, just like Prime Minister Netanyahu was in his first um, political run for office. But I am reminded, as we go back and look in our history, when Samuel was the prophet over Israel and God had anointed him to, for, to lead our people, but our forefathers were, were lifted up and wanted to be like the nations, and we wanted a king to lead us into battle. And God, you know, Samuel goes to God and says what's happening, and God says, they didn't reject you, Samuel. They've rejected me. He said, I will give them a king, but go tell them what will happen when they get the king. Now, I bring that up because why? In Micah chapter 4, Hashem asked us a question. Where is, 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 there, is there no king in thee? He speaks of the daughter of Zion being in travail. The daughter of Zion happens to be a future generation. It's not the daughter of, excuse me, it's not Zion. It's the daughter of Zion. It is that future generation, which is, our generation. And we're in travail. The nine-month negotiation that the United States set up, that's just a smokescreen. They'll think I don't know. And, and rabbis, if you do not know that that is a smokescreen going on, then, uh, brethren, you need to have your, uh, shake, shake the dust off your clothes and wake up to what's happening in Israel. And Rab Rabbi Chaim, I come there and go to a tour at the Temple Institute to have your spokesman say to us as a public group that Israel does not have control of Jerusalem. Is this a misquote or is it something you know that we do not know, the average citizen of Israel? We have a lot of issues. And allowing Rome to come back into power in Israel, even in the slightest, is a sin before God. Allowing the Dome of the Rock on the Temple Mount and allowing what I have seen with a Muslim mob ch chanting Allah Akbar on the Temple Mount and then our government do nothing about it? And then I, I, I sit there and I, I see the, the political comments that are out there. Uh, you know, Israel, we are a democracy. We're, we're a nation of freedom. Women have rights. Now, thank God for that. But then you say, even homosexuals have rights. 
Have we forgotten that God burned Sodom and Gomorrah for such evil and wickedness and then we act like it's no big deal? Because why? Politics? You know, if gay people want to be gay, let them be gay. Let them go to Europe. Israel is a godly nation, a holy nation, and we are a holy people. And we must act as that and act as such and conduct ourselves as such before God or God will not bless us. No, not me. I mean, we are home. We are not going to be plucked up. But I can tell you one thing. We are going to suffer losses on the battlefields in every direction if we don't put things in the right kind of order. Okay, now let's take a look at the Word of God here. Thus said the Lord to me, Go stand. I'm sorry. Uh, Jeremiah who? We're reading in uh, Yod Zayin. Uh, and uh, chapter 17, for those that speak English, um, Jeremiah, Jeremiah uh, chapter 17, and we're going to, uh, to verse uh, 19. So, and, uh, okay. Verse 19, Yod Tet uh, for, for the Hebrew brethren. Starting, starting there. Uh, Adonai, thus saith the Lord. It's the name Hashem for those in English that do not understand. This is God's divine name. This is what God is saying to the prophet Jeremiah. Who he is saying, thus saith the Lord. Go and stand in the gate of the uh, go 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 and stand in the gate of the children of the people by which the kings of Judah come in and by which they go out and the gates of Jerusalem, and say to them, Hear the word of the Lord, you kings of Judah, and all of Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So listen to this very carefully. This is not just for the Jews as well. The inhabitants of Jerusalem. In other words, every soul that is living in Jerusalem needs to hear this. This applies to to you as well. And this is important that the rabbis understand. This is important that our that the political leaders of Israel hear this. This is not my word. This is God's word to us and we need to listen to it very carefully. You kings of Judah say to them, hear the word of the Lord, you kings of Judah and all and, and all Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem that enter by these gates. And we're speaking about the gates of the cities, the city there, all those gates. Thus says the Lord, Ka o Adonai, take heed to yourselves, bear no burden on the Sabbath day, nor bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem. Neither carry forth a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day, neither do any work but hallow the Sabbath day. When it comes to God's word in Jerusalem, this is the covenant that he has set with our people. And I know, rabbinical brethren, I know you are obeying this word yourself. But the problem is, and this is why he addresses this to the political leaders because the political leaders are allowing the inhabitants of Jerusalem to come into the city of Jerusalem and to work on the Sabbath day to bring in the burdens and God is commanding it God is not this is not okay you know Israel you guys you Jewish people you you keep the Sabbath day it's just to you it's you know he is demanding this of all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Neither do work but hallow the Sabbath day. Hallow, by the way, is to sanctify it, make it pure and make it clean. As I commanded your fathers, but they obeyed not, neither inclined their ear, but made their necks stiff, 
See, our forefathers didn't, didn't obey this either. Now, Jeremiah is dealing in his day. So my, my question to my leaders in Israel, as well as the rabbinical leaders, have we not learned anything from history? They made their next step that they might not hear nor receive instruction and it shall come to pass if you diligently hearken to me, says the Lord, to bring in the burden, uh, says the Lord, to bring in, no, excuse me, to bring in no burden through the gates of this city on the Sabbath day, but hallow the Sabbath day to do no work on it. Then shall I there enter into the gates of this city kings and princes who sit upon the throne of David riding in chariots. Are we not looking for Mashiach? The princes, the anointed prince should come riding in. And the promise is, is if we will keep the Sabbath, not just the Jewish people, but even the inhabitants of Jerusalem and do not allow in his holy city to have the Sabbath profaned. Then God will bring in the princess of David. Then shall there enter into the gates of this city kings and princes who sit upon the throne of David riding in chariots and on horses, they and their princes, the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and this city shall remain forever. That's a perpetual covenant. God has sworn to us if we would just obey His word here, if we would obey the Sabbath not just us as Jews. You, you, no wonder why he addresses this to the political leaders. So, you know, I, I don't know all the cabinet ministers, but my Prime Minister Netanyahu, yourself, yes, I know who you are. Shimon Peres, former president, the new president, I know you guys and who you are, but I'm saying to you, God is bringing this to you. Ka Omer Adonai. And if he had revealed to me his name, I would tell you his name because I know that's what we want to know. In time, I believe he will. And they shall come from the cities of Judah and from the places about the Yerushalayim and from the land of Benjamin and from the coastal plain and from the mountains and from the Negev bringing burnt offerings and sacrifices and meal offerings and incense and bringing sacrifices of praise to the house of Hashem. But if you will not hearken to me to hallow the Sabbath day and not to bear a burden, and if you enter in at the gates of Yerushalayim on the Sabbath day, then will I kindle a fire in its gates and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem and it shall not, that it shall not be quenched. This has got to be put into place. And God is not even discussing yet the, the Temple Mount. But the problem is, is on the Temple Mount, they're going, they profane the Sabbath anyway. And we allow it. It must be put to a stop. If we expect the grace and mercy of God, put His Word into action. Now, let's back up a moment. I want to, still in the same chapter. Verse 5. Kaomel Adonai, thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his arm and whose heart departs from the Lord. Do you think that Pope Francis is going to bring peace in Israel? God says right here, not, by the way, if you, you know, it might be a guy comes along who's going to try to bring peace or something, you know, don't, don't trust him. No, he says, Kaomer Adonai, thus says the Lord, thus says Hashem. 
through the prophet Jeremiah who, Cursed be the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his arm and whose heart departs from the Lord. Might I add, Mr. Perez, what were you doing at the Vatican praying with a bunch of heathens? This... Prime Minister Netanyahu. My heart sank within me when I heard you call him the father of our common heritage. Pope Francis is nothing to do with the father of our common heritage. Abraham is the father of the common heritage of both Jew and Gentile alike, of the true Christian that supports Israel and that stands with Israel, not denies our existence, not calls the Palestinian a state, and we're just an occupying nation. That is the true Christian. Pope Francis is nothing like a Christian, although he exalts himself and claims to be Mashiach, puts himself in the place of Yeshua, this man called Jesus of Nazareth. He is a lie and an imposter and nothing more or less than the devil himself in a pair of shoes. Mr. Perez, you have the opportunity to repent if there is even mercy left. For he shall be like the juniper tree in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness and salt land and not inhabited. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. Hashem. Whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters and that spreads out its roots by the river and shall not see when heat comes, but its leaves shall be green and shall not be anxious in the year of drought, nor shall it cease from yielding fruit. Now what I'm going to say to you, my brethren, next is something you may not like very well but it needs to be said. I am doing a series that I will release in DVD format. It'll also be on the YouTube channel that you are tuning into now that I have begun to record. It is lengthy, but it identifies the Messiah and it is important that we recognize who Moshiach is. One clue is even right here in Jeremiah. In verse 13, it says, O Lord, the hope of Israel, and all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they who depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. Do you know what it means to be written in the earth? I mean, it says it right here. I mean, I'm reading right here from the Tanakh, Be'ivrit, okay? Be'eretz, Yakatev, excuse me, Yikatev, Katevu. This is something that would happen in the future. And when he says right here, they who depart from me shall be written in the earth. Because why? We have forsaken the Lord, the fountains of living waters. Written in the earth means our bodies would be buried there for rejecting the fountain of living waters. This is why our ancestors by the thousands, were killed 
Stalin, Mussolini, the pogroms, the Spanish Inquisition, which, by the way, was conducted by the Vatican. The Vatican, through Pope Pius XII, assisted Hitler in the destruction of the Jews during the Holocaust. I know in the Yad Vashem and my own family, thousands of family members, especially on my father's side, my mother's side as well, about 1,400 on my mother's side, many more on my father's side. Just as you, my brethren, have suffered as well, our families are written in the earth because what? We rejected the living waters. Let me just kind of highlight very quickly for you what I mean by we have rejected the living waters. Something for you to think about. Something maybe the scholars that have tried to show you this man called Yeshua or this Jesus of Nazareth that you have not accepted. Everything he did when he was here should have been an open sign to us that he was indeed Mashiach. But you see, God knew that we would not believe. He knew that. When he drew in the sand with his finger, when the rabbis brought up a woman who had been caught in the very act of adultery, one, my question is, rabbinical brethren, why didn't they bring the man with her? Why was it only the woman? But when he drew in the sand, and then he said, which one of you is without sin? Let him cast the first stone. The very fact that he wrote in the sand with his finger was identifying that he was the same God that wrote the Ten Commandments that Moses brought down on Mount Sinai. When he took in the man that was blind and he cried out, Yeshua, have mercy on me. And he goes up to him. And he's about to die himself. And he says, what would that I do for you? He said, Lord, that I might receive my sight. Then he takes and he spits on the ground and makes a, a, a mud pie, turns it into clay, then anoints it on his eyes in the sight of all Israel to see it. We should have recognized the same God that formed Adam from the dust of the earth was now putting clay over a man's eyes that was born blind. Was, the, was it that maybe he didn't have eyes? Was it maybe that because of the birth there was a defect in there? Washing at the pool of Siloam was not what gave the man his sight. It was the fact that the Creator was standing there, and when he put the clay over his eye, that eye reshaped and reformed the way God had intended it. When he said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. The way? Our forefathers wanted to know, how do we get back to the tree of life in the Garden of Eden? He says, I am that way. When he breathed in his apostles, when the Christian Bible writes about how that after the resurrection, he takes and he breathes in the nostrils, of, or excuse me, not breathes in the nostrils, he, he breathes on his apostles and he says to them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Why did he breathe upon them? We should have gotten it. It should have been obvious to the rabbinical brethren that were standing there. He's breathing on them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. He's letting you know that the same God that breathed on the nostrils of Adam, the clay figure there that was laying on the ground, the same God that had formed clay and put it on the blind man's eyes, He breathes into the nostrils of this clay figure and then life comes into him. Nishmar Chaim. And then that man became a living soul. In the Hebrew language, as you know, it's a singular when it speaks of him, but when he says Nishmar Chaim, Chaim, what is the Chaim? The Chaim, as we know, is the life of Hashem. It is the life of God Himself that was breathed into that body, but it was breathed in what? Chaim, Yod Mem, a plural form of God's life went into that man called Adam, or in this case, he was, he was called Ish. 
And we know, we know from the writings, we know from Rashi, we know from, from Rambam and, and, and many of the other commentators that write about the Torah that say that why is Ish Ish and Isha is Isha? It is because their name is from the compounded, uh, as a compounded form. Ish being the man, Aleph Yod Shin, the Yod representing the first letter of the divine name. Isha, Aleph Shin He, the last letter in her name representing the divine name, second letter of the divine name of God. Now we have Yah. And what do we have when you take the yod and the hay out? You have ash, the fire. So what was it? It was the fire of Hashem that was in her and in him. Isn't that interesting? Why? Because God breathed in the breath of life. This man, Yeshua, was breathing into the nostrils. Breathing into the nostrils. Or excuse me, breathing on his disciples, saying, receive you the Holy Ghost. He was demonstrating that he was the tree of life. Did he not say, I am the way, the truth, and the life? When our forefathers, when Moses, they come across the Red Sea, and the whole thing was all the miracles that our fathers had seen already, miracles that we have not even begun to see in this day, but soon will because God will send the two anointed ones, and when he does, then we will see, because the plagues will repeat. The plagues that were down in Egypt, it will be on a much greater scale. The waters will be turned to blood. The locust, everything you can imagine, just like it was in Egypt. Why? Because we have a modern-day Pharaoh. Pope Francis, the modern-day Pharaoh of Egypt, back in Rome again, I mean, excuse me, back in Israel again. Why? See, it, it says that when the two witnesses are killed, their bodies will lay in the street called Egypt and Sodom. Why Sodom? Because we have allowed homosexuality to flourish in the land of Israel and made it legal to do so. Egypt, because we've invited Rome back in. And don't say that we've not invited them back in. Don't say that you haven't given them anything. For them to push out, when, when our own rabbi that is over King David's tomb is not permitted to go in. He was not permitted to go up to the steps where the Last Supper room is uh, that the Vatican got a hold of. But then when we have our brothers and sisters that are praying in King David's tomb, a holy site for us as Jews, and they are forced out by our own police, by their own Jewish people, it reminds me, it is reminiscent of Nazi Germany. I know we haven't stooped to that point yet. I realize that. But when we take and we use the Jewish military police to tell Orthodox Jewish believers they cannot pray in a holy site that belongs to them and push them out so that the Vatican, the Catholic Church, can come and have a mass in the very tomb of David. Don't tell me then that Rome doesn't have control. Why are the Palestinians still on the Temple Mount? Because you've given Rome control. Why are they chanting all Jews out of Jerusalem? Somebody's let the cat out of the bag somewhere. That's an American expression. In other words, they already know there's some kind of deal between the Vatican and between Israel. And soon enough, in East Jerusalem, you're going to take the Jewish families and you're going to pull them out of there. You know how I know it? It's written in Micah 4. It's written in the Christian Bible called Revelation 11. Revelation 11 says that you will give the holy city unto the Gentiles and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months, three and a half years. Don't think I don't know? Everything is written right here. Now I told you, Moses takes, when, the, when our brethren came out, and they were murmuring against Moses. You remember what God says the argument was about? They were arguing whether or not God was with us or not. Now, this is like two weeks into the Exodus journey after crossing the Red Sea, and there was no water. And so the children of Israel are cr crying and complaining and saying to Moses, did you bring us out here to die? And they questioned whether or not God was among them or not after God just parted the Red Sea for them. 
And they question if God is even among us or not. Oh my God. Is God among us or not? So God tells Moses, take the elders of Israel with you. Go out and smite the rock that it bring forth its waters. God was showing that in order to bring forth the waters of life, the rock would have to be smitten. My brethren, do you understand what I'm saying to you? God told Moses, take the elders of Israel with you. Why? The elders of Israel were to come and to judge the rock. It was to judge the people. It was to bring about judgment. They smote the rock that it could bring forth the waters of life. The rock had to be smitten. David says, Isaiah says, that Hashem was upon the rock. When this man called Yeshua came, what did he say to the Samaritan woman? Rabbi Singer, I know you know this because you have studied the Christian Bible as well. And, 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 and don't try the loopholes. You know as well, Nehemiah Gordon, he knows, he's a Karai Jew, he has studied the Hebraic writings of Matthew. And I can only imagine the rest of the Gospels are actually written in the Hebraic language as well. But the Vatican has got all that gobbled up too so, not, so we can't find out what was really said. No doubt if we knew what was really said, we would probably already be believing that Yeshua was Mashiach after all. And you know, this is why I believe Nehemiah Gordon doesn't want to be called a Christian. And I know he says he's never really truly embraced it, but he's got a greater respect for this man Yeshua. In what he said, not what the Christian people have said. And this is no disrespect to the Christians that are watching, because I know thousands will watch this video. No disrespect to you, my brother. You have to understand, I have to talk to my own people right now, very serious. We're in a very serious hour in our country. Uh, we are at the brink of all kinds of chaos breaking loose. We've got problems on, on up in the Golan. We've got problems on the Syrian border. We've got problems with Gaza. We've got problems with, with uh, Hamas the Palestinian Authority. We've got problems on the Lebanese border. We've got problems on the Egyptian border. We are, we are, we are in, a, in a crisis here. And I guarantee you one thing, if the Vatican doesn't get their way, you can count on we're going to have an invasion. But we shouldn't suffer a single loss of life. And if Joshua was here, if my father was here, Joshua, Joshua Binun, and my name is Katriel Binun, I am his son, his grandson. If he was here and we had a loss of life, he would stop the whole campaign and find out what is wrong. And we're losing life because we're missing something here. We got to find out what is wrong. You know, it's funny. God tells you, thus saith the Lord, keep the Sabbath and, and do not let anyone. He doesn't even put it on the rest of Israel. Just Jerusalem. God wants you to hallow the Sabbath in Jerusalem with the stranger as well as with the Jews. And if you would honor that word, he would begin to reveal to you where we went wrong. Where have we made our mistake? Yeshua comes to the Samaritan woman and he says to her, he says, woman, bring me a drink. I'm just paraphrasing this. So, so if you're out there, you're Christian, you try to quote everything I say. I'm paraphrasing this. He said, woman, bring me a drink. And she says, sir, uh, you're a Samaritan and I'm a Jew. We have no dealings with one another. And we know how the story goes on. He says, if you knew it was it was talking to you, you would ask me for a drink. Because he also goes into how the well is deep. She says, you have nothing to draw with. You know, I, I forget exactly the full detail of the story in that regards there. But the point was, though, is she, he tells her, if you knew who was talking to you, you'd ask me for a drink, and I would give you water that you don't have to come here no more. Hello. What do we have right here in Jeremiah? What does Jeremiah say in verse 13? Oh, Lord, the hope of... See, oh, Lord, the hope of Israel. Our hope. All that forsake thee shall be ashamed. You wonder why Zechariah 12, why only the tribes, uh, three tribes, 
the house of Israel, and of course all the families that remain come back. We see the house of David, the house of Nathan, the, the house of Levi, their families, and the house of Shimei and their families apart are going to mourn when they see him whom they what thrust through. That's why I say, Rabbi Singer, I love you, my brother. We don't want to make a play on words. I know it says thrust through as well in Hebrew. I understand that. I'm not talking about the piercing in his hands, and I know the Word of God is not talking about the piercing in his hands. The thrust through is when the Roman soldier took that spear and stabbed it in his side, and the water came out of his side, separated from his blood. That's what the Scripture is talking about. That's where we begin to recognize our sins. Why does God say in the, through the prophet Zechariah that he brings home the house of Judah first? Because you see, the house of Israel was never guilty in the sins of what happened to Yeshua. Our forefathers, because I'm tribe of Ephraim on that side there, we'd already messed up. We'd already messed up. Everything was all out of whack there. But isn't it, isn't it interesting too that because we know Nathan and David are both from the tribe of Judah. Of course, the Levites are the Levites. Shimei is from the tribe of Benjamin. And the families remain the Samaritans, of course. See, what is it? Again, the house of Judah is brought back home. Why Shimei? Because we know in the story of David, and I'll just kind of make this quick. What happens with David? Avshalom, his son, Absalom is the, Jew, the Greek way of writing his name, Absalom. But for my Jewish brother, it's Absalom. Absalom takes, and he never really recognizes his father to be the king. And we know that he knows he's king. I'm not saying that. The point is, is he doesn't recognize spiritually that he's the king of Israel. Had he really known that his father was king and God called king of Israel, he would have never done a coup and got the people to side with him to overthrow his father. Absalom is a type of Israel 2,000 years ago that when the king of Israel, and this is why Pilate has the name written, uh, uh, put on the cross like he did, the king of the Jews, I know we didn't like it. You know, you forget my forefathers were there right along in this. The Levites, my own family, we were right there. Right there making the same mistakes. And as we made those mistakes, Absalom doesn't recognize his father, does a coup, comes against him. David takes his, with his men and he says, let's flee Jerusalem or there'd be a lot, large loss of life. He crosses the Kidron Valley, he and his men. He leaves behind 10 concubines. It's kind of ironic, isn't it? Because in the Christian Bible, it speaks about 10 virgins, five are wise and five are foolish. A concubine is a common law wife. There's not been, a concubine is not, there's not a proper, proper marriage ceremony like a wife is. And see, the thing is, is why? It represents the Christian believers, the 10 virgins. Why? They are a bride to Christ, but they have not, they're, they've not had a proper marriage as of yet. Whereas we had a proper marriage with God on Mount Sinai. It, the, the, the Christian believer has not had it yet, so they were the concubines. And so what, is, what is, happens with, with, with Absalom, or David leaves behind the ten concubines, and Absalom abuses them. Oh, he goes into them and everything, you know, but he abuses them. The same that we have done as Jews with the Christians. Now, now, I realize the table was turned. The, the, the so-called Christian, the Vatican, the, these are not Christians, brother, sister. These are not Christians. The Catholic Church that conspired with, with Hitler and all of his regime and, and back during the Inquisition and everything else, that is not Christianity. The true Christians are the ones that have loved us, that have loved Israel, that have stood by us down through all the years. There's always been a little small minority of Christians that loved Israel and stood by our people no matter what. And during the Holocaust, there were many that risked their lives. Yeah, some of them were Catholic. But they went against their own church to do it. And those are the ones that we've ridiculed for their beliefs. 
That's what it is when Absalomon, excuse me, Absalom, not Absalomon, Absalom rejects them. Now, David crosses the Kidron Valley. He looks back over Jerusalem. He weeps over Jerusalem, just like Yeshua goes up over and crosses the Kidron Valley, weeps over Jerusalem and says, how often I would have hovered you as a hen with her own brood, but you would not. He said, your house is left desolate unto, to you until you say, blessed is he that comes in the name of Hashem. So those of you that don't think that he didn't prophesy, I'm sure he prophesied. He also prophesied there would not be one stone left upon another. He was speaking of the temple, not the temple mount. Hello. And we can see where the stones are laying there on the bottom. There's not one stone up there. Instead, we've, we've allowed the Dome of the Rock to get erected. Why? Because we've been in exile. But the thing is, is we have the ability to change that right now. You do not have to listen to the arm of man. You do not have to listen to the Pope. He is not our Mashiach. At any rate, though, let me get into real fast, bring this around. David takes so, he goes out, and as he leaves with his men, now, his men even said to him, we are more than able, we will fight. If you want to fight, we will fight. Absalom, there was no way he and his men could defeat David and his men because they were true warriors. Old or not, they were true warriors, and God would have delivered them. Isn't it funny that Yeshua makes that very comment when Peter cuts off the ear of the... Uh, high priest's servant. And Yeshua tells him, put away your sword, Peter. Do you not know that if I wanted, I could call 10 legions of angels right now? Another place he tells, he says to, to, to one of the, when they have him in captivity, he says to them, if I was here to take over, you know, this paraphrasing again, my, those that follow me, they would fight. So easily Yeshua could have fought but he knew that he couldn't because there was a reason behind it. Just like David. David crosses the River Jordan. Yeshua crosses the River Jordan spiritually, just like who? Elijah did. As David goes up, Shimei takes and spits on him and curses him and everything else. Throws stones at his men. His men said, should we let this dog's head stay on his body? He said, "Lord, my Lord, let me kill him. David said, let him alone. Hashem said for him to do this. Now later when David comes back, David, Shemai meets him down at the river. Now it's kind of interesting too. Before David is willing to come back, he sends the message and says, to the house of Judah, why are you the last to have me come home? And he had given instructions, get the people in one heart, in one mind. You know, God's going to have two witnesses come on the scene. According to Revelation 11, according to Zechariah's prophecy, the two anointed ones. And it's going to get our people in one mind, in one accord. So why? This man that the Christians have called Yeshua, the Mashiach, so he can return. So it doesn't have to be a guesswork anymore. Was he or was he not really the Mashiach? We'll see for ourselves. This is why we see Shimei written in Zechariah's prophecy. And there is going to be a lot of weeping on that day. Anyway, though, when Yeshua makes the comment to the woman about the water, I would give you water that you don't have to come here to draw anymore. When that water flow, flowed from his side, when that spear pierced his side, it was identifying that he was that water of life. That inside of him was the Eitz Chaim, the tree of life. No wonder why he breathed on his apostles after his resurrection and said, Receive you the Holy Ghost. So he really is that way. There's so many more things I could go into with you. But if you want to know more, the film that I'm making that I'm going to be, it'll be into a DVD format. It'll be free of charge. And that'll be because of the courtesy of the people that love us and love the work that we're doing here. There are literally thousands of Christians that listen to the things that we say here and their love 
for you is that you'll know that Yeshua is Mashiach. They're not, their desire is not to see that Israel is taken over by the Vatican. The people that, that are Christian believers, they want the Jewish people to believe, to know that Yeshua was indeed Mashiach. They're longing for that hour and that day that you will believe this. And they're the ones that will make it possible that we can give as many as you need away free. And as far as the two witnesses, when God sends them, I have no idea when. I have no idea who they are. But if there's anything we can do now to get you to recognize what's going on, that's what we're here for. There's many other videos you can go watch if you want to go watch and see that reveal things. I'm going to close now, but I, the only thing I encourage you to understand, my rabbinical brethren, let me just mention your names again. Rabbi, rabbis Shlomo Amar, Yona Metzger, Eliyahu, Bekshad Doren, Shalom uh, Kohen, Rabbi Winston, Tobias Singer, uh, Eve Gador, uh, Nevetzal, Shemuel Rabinovich, Tzvi Yehuda Kuk, Avraham Elkana uh, Shapira, Zalaman Melamed, Melamed, Med, uh, Rabbi Misrachi, Rabbi Chaim Richman, and to the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, President, former President Shimon Perez, and the new Prime Minister, of, or President of Israel now. My apology. I cannot for the life of me remember your name right now. May your ears be open to hear. May the God of Israel open your heart to know that what I'm saying to you is in love. I also, I will send this video as well to Nehemiah Gordon. And I pray and trust my brother. It'll be a blessing to you as well. God bless you. Lahad Tov. Well, in your case, this is the breaking of the morning in Israel now. So when this video loads, it'll be mid-morning. So I say to my brethren in Israel, Boketov. Shalom, shalom. Regam Shabbat shalom for you, because this is the beginning of...